Habit number five. They would use the competitive, political, and supportive energy of other researchers. Now, I mentioned again that my impression, my first impression of researchers was wrong. I thought that many of them would be sitting behind the computer and not doing very much. But actually, they were very active and involved socially, and they used these social connections to create more papers. They used these social relationships to keep themselves motivated when they were writing. And there were three kinds of energy that they would receive from these social relationships. Competitive, political, and supportive. Now, particularly at the PhD level, you guys are mainly PhD students, I think. There were three labs that I looked at who used this supportive energy a lot. In fact, they weren't really labs, they were collections from different labs. They had writing groups every week. Very interesting. I attended a couple of them. What did they do in the writing group? Well, they would get together every Monday night, a group of about 10 PhD students, and they would push each other to publish more papers. They would say, Bob, how's your research going? And Bob would say, well, it's coming. Bob, I want to see your introduction. Well, I didn't finish it this week. Bob, how can you not finish it this week? Bob, I'll send it to you tomorrow. <laughs> and then let's talk to Lucy. Lucy, how are you doing? Oh, fine, here's my abstract. What do you guys think? Hmm. Here we can change and here we can modify and this can be better. The purpose of getting together in those writing groups was they were able to inspire and motivate each other. And they had to finish by next Monday night because everybody's waiting for them. Everybody's waiting to see their paper. Everybody's waiting to see the next step in their process. They gave each other deadlines. And the deadlines they gave each other were much more aggressive than their professor. Their professor would say, okay, this semester I need this finished. The writing group says, next week we need this, this, this. So these people need three times more than other PhD students within their They were pushing each other. That, that supportive energy was so valuable in creating and pushing and motivating the ideas. Consider this yourself. Consider how you could get a couple high-functioning PhD students together in a writing group. When you put together that group and you start meeting regularly, that time will be very productive. The second kind of energy that they would get from each other was competitive. I found this particularly true uh, at the assistant professor level, assistant and associate professor, younger professors. There were often within one department two guys who published three times more than everybody else, four times more than everybody else. They published a lot. And when I talked to them, I found that these two guys were competing with each other. So if John gets an SCI paper, I want two SCI papers. And if Harry gets a high impact factor, I want a higher one. And the two laboratories would understand that this was a war. And the PhD students, oh, we got to beat Professor John, <laughs> writing more papers. Oh, higher impact factor, we need a better journal. <laughs> and there was like two teams of students who were fighting each other, competing against each other, not in a bad way, but in a positive way. Competition makes you produce amazing things. It's remarkable what you do when you're under pressure from the guy down the hall. And so these two professors would make this kind of war between each other to make everybody produce a lot more research. And the third kind of energy was political. This was an interesting aspect of the relationships between professors. Professors and researchers in all of the interviews that I talked to understood the political nature of the review process. That when a reviewer receives your 
paper. He is not just a machine who will analyze good, bad, accept, reject. No, he's a person. And as a person, he has his own feeling and his own motivations that are involved in his review process. And sometimes bad papers <laughs> can be accepted in good journals because of the relationship between reviewers. In fact, there was a study that's done here. I've got the citation. Half of the peer-reviewed articles in the top-rated journals were never referenced by anyone, including the author. How is that possible? How can half of the journal papers in the top journals be zero-impact papers? Zero-impact papers in top-rated journals is the political relationship. There is a club at some level of people who accept other people's papers. Now this is the negative side, but it's the reality of the review process. How can we deal with this reality as PhD students in Taiwan? Join the club. <laughs> Probably the best advice I can give. And I'm going to give you a lot of different tips about how to do that in the next part of our class here. I'm not saying that your English is not important. It is. And I'm not saying, certainly, that research is not important. It's very important. I just want us to understand that there is a third political element as well in the review process. And we need to understand this in order to be productive and effective researchers. Let's take a look at some of the ways that this happens. First, don't criticize your references. Who are your references? In the paper, you cite other authors, right? You put them in your introduction, in your literature review. <clears throat> These are called your references. Now, I read a lot of papers with this problem from my students. One of my students, he'll write a paper, he'll basically say, first page, uh, Johnson was stupid and Smith was an idiot and I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> okay, they're going to have this in... What happens when Johnson and Smith are your reviewers? <laughs> are they going to love you criticizing them? No. They're going to reject. The reason? Poor English. <laughs> I suspect that this is a big reason for rejection. That some professors, some researchers, are old, they've been in their field a long time, and they don't want to see some new PhD student telling the whole world that they're stupid. Even if they think you're right, they have a high motivation to reject your paper and make sure nobody else knows about it. 